The next topic I'm going to speak about is living under Islam, for Christians particularly. What does Islam say about um, the situation of people living under Islamic rule? One thing I want to emphasize is that Muslims are incredibly diverse, and some Muslims follow the God of their conscience. And they say their prayers seven, you know, five times a day, and they, um, they believe in a God who their conscience tells, tells them he is. They don't necessarily drill down to all these fundamentals and implement it. But if you have a nation that says, we're a Sharia state, we're going to organize our country using these principles, then the materials of the kind that I've been describing suddenly become public policy, and the society is structured on, along these lines. Now, um, as I said, Islam means surrender or submission, but actually there's two kinds of surrender. There's surrender of conversion, and there's also the surrender of political surrender, and that's what many Christian communities did uh, under Islamic conquest. They agreed to live under Islam as subject peoples. And that's what I'd like to speak about today. What is the role of non-Muslims living in an Islamic state who've surrendered to jihad conquest? Islam claims um, to be the original religion, the religion of Adam. And according to this view, Christians and Jews are people of the book. They are, in a sense, Muslims who've lost their way. The, you know, Jesus was a Muslim, according to the Quran. Uh, but, and we have in become separated from Islam uh, through our scriptures being corrupted. But Muhammad was sent as the final guide to get us and everyone back on the straight path. A true Christian would accept Islam and, and follow Muhammad according to this view. And Islam also teaches that Muslims have a divine mandate or destiny to um, impose guidance on the world. This is a protester in Los Angeles whose, whose T-shirt says, I command what's right, and I forbid what's wrong. So that the role of the Muslim community is to implement the, the commands of Allah, not just for Muslims, but for, for the world. And so this is important for Christians living under Islamic rule. They come under this, this mandate. Um, Islam also claims its right to dominate. He it is who sent his messenger with the guidance and the religion of truth that he may cause it to triumph over all religions. And um, there's a protester in New York who's got the White House with the black flag of Islam and his message is Islam will dominate, meaning politically and militarily. It will conquer. He's learned that in the mosque, you know. He's been taught that. It's not something he made up. And according to many authorities, the purpose of jihad is to impose this obligation. This is a a statement by the former Chief Justice of Saudi Arabia, and he's speaking about the fighting in the Quran. He said it was forbidden at first, later it was permitted, after that it was made obligatory against it for defensive purposes, and finally against everyone who worship others alongside Allah. So that means jihad fighting becomes an obligation against anyone who's not a Muslim, according to the Chief Justice of Saudi Arabia. So what does it mean to live under these, these consequences, live under conquest? live under the dominance of Islam. Why is it so? Where does it come from? How does it structure? What's it like? What's it been like in history? What's the outcome of Islamization that becomes successful enough to dominate a society? Um, Khaibar was a, um, a village, a, a, an oasis in, in Arabia, it still is, which was primarily settled by Jews. And um, it was attacked by Muhammad, and he... he he killed some, he took a, he took a concubine there, a wife too, um, but he, he also allowed the Jews to, to keep their religion, provided they pay a tax of 50% of their harvest to the Muslims. And he still remembered, Amrozi, who was a Balinese bomber when he was convicted in Indonesia, uh, he shouted out in the courtroom, remember Khaiba, O oh, Jews, the armies of Muhammad are coming back to defeat you. And he said, remember, Khaibar, because Khaibar is the, is the point in Islamic history where the first permission was given to non-Muslims to live under Islam, keeping their religion, provided they pay tribute. And um, this, this, this event in Islamic law sets the pattern which determines the fate of Jews, Christians, Hindus and others, millions and millions of people uh, down through history. Um, 
I'm going to move through this. I don't have time to talk about Muhammad's uh, attacks against the Jews and how he ended up um, at attacking them. But he, he, the outcome was that he allowed some, as I said, to keep their faith, provided they uh, surrender and pay taxes. And the name for this, this treaty of surrender that the Jews there came to live under is, is a Dhimma, the Dhimma Pact. And this word Dhimma in Arabic means to, to, means to blame or to be at fault. So a Dhimma Pact is a pact of liability or debt that's owed by a conquered people. And in Islamic law, people of the book, Jews or Christians, are allowed to surrender to Islamic rule, provided they um, accept the conditions of the Dhimma Pact, which is a, an institution set within the Sharia, within Islamic law. And the Dhimma sets the legal, social, political, cultural status of non-Muslim communities living under Islam. It's a concession to people of the book, so it's not available to um, it wasn't available to pagan Arabs, and where Islam has made its way down into Africa, the, the, this option of surrender has not been made available to, um, to, uh, to African pagans who are considered not to be people of the book. They had a choice of conversion or, or death or enslavement. But it was a concession made to Christians and Jews because they were considered to be uh, have, a, have an Islamic history originally, and they're allowed to do this until you know, until end times, they can keep their religion provided they surrender and pay these taxes. Um, there's a verse in the Quran that's uh, the foundation of this principle, which is Surah 9, 29, which says, fight against basically the people of the book, those that don't accept the religion of Islam, until they are humbled and they surrender and they pay jizya, they pay tribute uh, out of hand. So they pay re readily, they pay tribute to the Muslims and they surrender. So... Um, this is the verse in the Quran that's the foundation of warfare against Jews and Christians to, to, to cause them to live under Islamic rule. This was extraordinarily successful. The ancient centers of Christianity where the major patriarchs were were Rome, Constantinople, um, Antioch, Jerusalem and Alexandria. Alexandria, Jerusalem and Antioch were all conquered within the first century. Uh, Constantinople was conquered um, 700 years later and Rome remains as the only um, unconquered, it was sacked in the, I think the 10th, 9th century, but it's the only unconquered um, original kind of major Christian center yet. But there are hadiths that say it will fall. Um, so there are two aspects to, um, to this, this verse. One is the tribute payment for those that have surrendered. And also being humble, being made small, it says in Arabic. What does this mean? I'm going to unpack this for you. What does it mean to be a dhimmi, someone living under a dhimma covenant, under Islamic rule? Um, firstly, the, the dhimma status is perpetual. It lasts from generation to generation. It's an intergenerational covenant of surrender. It's linked to the jihad. It's a concession which allows dhimmis to keep their lives and their property, and their wives, their families provided they pay compensation as a liability to their conquerors. And there, there are other choices. You can convert to Islam. You can, um, you can fight. So the sword is an option. Uh, it's considered by Islamic law to be a choice to surrender. So the dhimmi is someone who is not a Muslim living under Islamic rule and subjected to a dhimmi pact. They pay a, a tax, the jizya, and the word jizya in Arabic means reparations, compensation, um, so, uh, or tribute. So it, this is a compensation that's paid to the Muslims. What are you compensating them for when you're a limi, when the, it's a, the men pay the tax? Well, you're compensating them for not killing you and taking your property and your wives and your family as their slaves. So you're compensating them year by year uh, for the for, for, for foregoing their right to take what's yours. And it's a perpetual compensation you have to pay each year. They're allocated to the Muslim community. So this is a commentary um, on the Quran from Algeria in the 19th century, at Fayish. He's commentating on, commentating on 929. He says, it was said that jizya, the tribute which Christians pay, or Jews pay, is a satisfaction for their blood. 
It, it is said that it has sufficed to compensate for their not being slain. Its purpose is to substitute for the duties, the word is wajib, and of the obligation of killing and slavery. It's for the benefit of the Muslims. So what this commentary is saying is that the, 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 the compensation was paid to compensate a Muslim for foregoing his duty to kill and enslave non-Muslims. This is a description of the, of the tribute payment from Morocco. Um, on the day of payment, the dhimmis will be assembled in a public place. They should be standing there waiting in the lowest and the dirtiest place. Then the acting officials representing the law will be placed above them and will adopt a threatening attitude. So it seems to them as well as to others that our object, our purpose is to degrade them by pretending to take their possessions. They'll realize what we, that we're doing them a favor and accepting this distribute from them and letting them go free. Then they'll be dragged one by one to, to exact the payment. When paying, the dhimmi will receive a blow. That's actually a blow on the neck. Uh, and will be thrown aside so that he'll think that he's escaped the sword through this. This is the way that the friends of the Lord, that is of Muhammad of the first and last generations, will act towards their infidel enemies, for might belongs to Allah and to the apostles. So this is describing the ritual of payment of the tax. And what happened across the Islamic world was that when Dhimis paid the tax, they'd be struck on the neck as a symbol of their decapitation. And they'd pay the tax to show, and that, and, and that blow would be to show that they're escaping, losing their heads by paying the tax. And I was really interested in this, this ritual. Um, oh, this is a commentary by William Eaton, who in 1799 describes uh, this situation in the Ottoman Empire. And he says, the words that are told to Christians or Jews living under Ottoman rule when they pay this tax... Uh, is to instruct them that they're only being allowed to keep their heads for another year because of the payment of this money. So this is a report from a very different time and place, um, but it's basically saying the same thing. And I was really interested in this ritual, and I spent a lot of years uh, searching for references to it in commentaries and in reports by Muslims and non-Muslims, and I found reports from the 9th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, 18th, 19th, and 20th century of this ritual. And the last time it was practiced before the Islamic State came in was in Afghanistan in the 1950s, but it was very widespread throughout the Muslim world. Actually, still today, to strike someone on the neck in, say, Greek culture or Egyptian culture is considered very, very insulting. And there's a kind of residual cultural memory of this ritual and what it stands for. Um, this is a commentary I mentioned Ibn Kathir to you before. Ibn Kathir, um, is commenting on 929, and he says that paying his tax is a sign of um, disbelief and disgrace. Uh, and he then explains that in paying this tax, this tax is meant to be a sign that non-Muslims, the Christian or the Jew, is disgraced and humiliated by this process. This is the purpose of it in Islamic law. Um, they are miserable, disgraced and humiliated. And... Um, and it, his commentary refers to conditions that were imposed upon the Christians when they were first conquered in Syria, which they willingly accepted. And uh, gives a list, he then gives a list of these conditions. Uh, this is one of the earliest documented Dhimma Pacts. It's known as the Pact of Umar, and you sometimes see references to it in the, in the literature. Um, these conditions, the conditions under which Christians were required to live after surrender, were meant to ensure their continued humiliation, degradation, and disgrace. So let me talk about the conditions of living under Islamic rule. There are a lot of regulations that apply to, to dhimmis, to Christians and Jews living under Islam. Um, you're forbidden to uh, try to convert a Muslim, for example, to Christianity. It's forbidden to hinder a dhimmi from entering Islam. Um, to convert to Christianity from Islam brings the death penalty. A marriage is regulated. A Muslim man can marry a Christian or Jewish woman. Their children are Muslims, but the other way around is forbidden. It's forbidden for a Muslim woman to marry a, a Christian or a Jewish man. Um, no new churches are allowed to be built after conquest. Churches are not allowed to be repaired after conquest. This is actually a big issue in Egypt today. There have been riots and, and Christian communities have been ransacked and looted when they tried to repair a church or build a dome on a church or extend a church. 
these conditions which date from the 8th century, 9th century, they still affect the mentality and the attitudes of Muslims in Muslim countries. Um, there's not meant to be any public display of a religion, of your religion, no public display of crosses. Dhimmi houses should be smaller than Muslim houses. Um, Dhimmis had to dress differently. The, the, the idea of coloured patches for people according to their religion was an invention of medieval Islam. Hitler didn't come up with it first. Dhimmi has to get out of the way for Muslims. They have to adopt a humble appearance, forbidden uh, to raise a hand against a Muslim, forbidden to curse a Muslim. Dhimmis couldn't own or carry arms, not allowed to have any means of self-defence. Um, the blood of a Muslim is not equal to the blood of a Dhimmi, so this means that if a Muslim kills a Dhimmi, Islamic law says that he can't be put to death. But if he kills a Muslim, he has to be put to death. Um, I won't go over everything. Uh, Christians, according to Islam, are not allowed to have public office over a Muslim. Um, Dhimmi testimony is not valid. Christian testimony is not valid against Muslim testimony in a, in a Sharia court. Um, this means that Christians are very vulnerable in the law. If your neighbour takes your property and you give testimony against him and he's a Muslim, his testimony will override your testimony. And Christians have to bribe Muslims in order to give testimony on their behalf, really. It's very, you're very vulnerable. And this is why there's a lot of expropriation taking of land uh, in Pakistan of Christians, because Christians' word is not considered to have validity in the legal process against their Muslim neighbours. Um, Dhimmis had to look after and house Muslim soldiers. They're forbidden from any public display of their religion, no funeral processions, no loud singing. If you look at photographs of Jerusalem from the 19th century, none of the churches have crosses on them because that was forbidden in Islamic law to display the cross publicly. In Malaysia, churches have gotten into trouble today because they put a, a cross in a public place outside the building and Muslims are offended by that. They feel that's unacceptable. In Melbourne, there was a case, actually, where um, the, the council gave some land for religious centres and there was to be a Catholic centre and a Muslim centre, and the Muslims complained that there was a, a big tower on the Catholic church which was higher than the mosque or the community religious centre and had a cross on it. So they found that they were actually trying to impose a dhimmi condition on the Catholic church in Melbourne. Because that's, they felt it was right, that it was wrong for that to happen, that the cross would be displayed next to them. Um, Dhimmis were forbidden from teaching their children about Islam, not allowed to critique the system, not allowed to ride horses, the coloured patches, um, and so on. And you get lots of practices that result from this discriminatory system. Very common, you read reports saying that Muslim children will throw stones at Christians um, and, or at Jews. Uh, cursing also uh, is a commonly reported. Um, Taking of children. In Yemen, the Dhimmi Jews living in Yemen, if a child was orphaned, they had to be handed over to the Muslim community and to be brought up as a Muslim. Uh, and the, the Ottomans actually took one in five, they would take the uh, Christian children and train them to be slave soldiers and use them to fight against the European Christian nations, the Janissaries. And what's really interesting about this Pact of Umar is that the pact says, the Christians say, that if we break any of these conditions, the Muslims are entitled to treat us as enemies of jihad. You're allowed to restart the jihad, which means rape, looting, killing. So the Christians, in agreeing to these conditions of surrender, understand that if they break any of these conditions, then they will be subject to war. And there are many times in history where attacks have, have been launched against a community which has some way or other broken this, this pact. There was a case in Pakistan, sorry, in the Palestinian territories where it was, it was rumoured or it was said that a Muslim girl had had a friendship with a Palestinian Christian boy. And the Muslims got very angry and they ransacked a whole village. They looted a whole village shouting, Allahu Akbar, because this was a violation of a Dhimmi Pact condition. And one of the results of that is jihad starts. And one of the activities in jihad is looting and taking the property of the enemy. Uh, there's many examples of this down through history. Um, or even Kodama, a Muslim theorist, the protected person who violates his pact by refusing to pay tribute or to submit to the laws of the Islamic community makes his person and his goods halal, that is, they're free to be taken or killed or captured by Muslims. So the result of 
not keeping these conditions is looting, rape, enslavement and death. And there's many examples. Um, the Jews in Granada were massacred um, when one of their, their leading members became too successful and was appointed a Grand Vizier by the Sultan. This made the Muslim community furious and they were killed in, 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 um, in 1066. The same thing happened to the Christians in Damascus in 1860, a very famous massacre at that time. And the reason was that the Christians had been released from the Vimma Pact by the Ottomans and they were raising their heads too high and they weren't acting in a subservient way. So it was preached in the mosques that they were no longer protected because they were no, no longer acting in an inferior way. And so uh, the massacre resulted. It's very well documented. There was an Englishman there at the time. He described what was happening in the mosque, the teaching, the enslavement of the children, the killing of the men, and, and the outcomes that happened. Um, I mentioned the riots in Tiber. Tax on cops in Egypt follow similar patterns. Uh, extension of a church, uh, um, some sort of thing that offends Muslims according to them and principles results in a, in a riot and in, in, even in a massacre. And attacks on Christians in Iraq have also repeated these patterns. In, you know, one of the effects of the um, foreign occupation of Iraq was that local jihadi fighters would begin to implement jih uh, Dhimma conditions on Christian communities, extracting jizya from them, uh, punishing them if they didn't pay. The Islamic State has done this as well. It's, it's actually looked back to these old textbooks to find even the amount of gold that Christians have to pay in order to escape this, um, this penalty. Now, just as a culture of slavery can build into a nation uh, a worldview of racism that continues and can continue for generations, so the Dhimma um, legislation system, the Dhimma system, produces a psychology or an attitude of limitude, um, as it's called, which can dominate and oppress uh, non-Muslims in an Islamic society well after all these laws and principles have been set aside and the effects of this can go on for a, a long time. Um, I'm going to keep moving here. This is a commentary from Ibn Ajiba, who was a 18th century Moroccan commentator. And he, he's explaining in his commentary on 929 that the purpose of this system was to destroy any uh, desire for um, Im improvement or leadership or, or honour in the heart of a, of a dhimmi. So the purpose of the system is to destroy their will. And so they'll give exactly what's required of them. The Dhimmi is commanded to put his soul, good fortune, and desires to death. Above all, he should kill the love of life, leadership, and honour. He is to invert the longings of his soul. He is to load it down more heavily than it can bear until it's completely submissive. Thereafter, nothing will be unbearable for him. He will be indifferent to subjugation or might. Poverty and wealth will be the same. Praise and insult will be the same. Preventing and yielding will be the same. Lost and found will be the same. Then when all things are the same, the soul will be submissive and yield willingly what it should give. So this is the commentary of a, of a Muslim commentator explaining what the Dhimmi system is meant to do to the soul of a, of a non-Muslim living under it. One of the things that's also important to note is that Christians who live under this system are affected by the psychology of inferiority and they can, as a self-protective mechanism, actually partner with it. It's like the battered wife syndrome, where the, the battered woman um, protects her husband and praises him while being the object of his violence. So that Christians and others who live under Islamic rule are not always the best, they don't always give the clearest testimony about what it means to be in that situation because they're at risk for their lives and what they will say about their circumstances is influenced by the need to live and to survive. This affects how, for example, Palestinian Christians speak about their experience to us and others as well. Um, it's a mentality of limitude, of a kind of inferiority that where you have to partner with your oppressor in order to survive. Um, oh, yeah, what's happening here? Um, this is a problem also for Christian ethic of love. You know, are we loving Muslims or are we actually adopting an attitude of inferiority to them? Because if, if a dhimmi is servile and praising Muslims and, and doing that in order to survive, then that's not interpreted as love. That's interpreted as a service that's due. 
This happens in Egypt all the time. Like a group of cops gets, gets attacked, maybe someone is killed. There's a mandated reconciliation session that the government requires, after which the, you know, the local Coptic priest kisses the imam and they, they all you know, they say, oh, we've all resolved this in a peaceful way. It's wonderful. Islam is good. <laughs> and then it happens all over again. And this is a, a, it's a, it's a, it's a very black kind of spiritual circumstance to be trapped into. Um, Okay, I've given quite a number of examples now of people in the West, leaders in the West, who, who make statements that sound as if they're speaking from a dhimmi position, for the dhimmi voice. They're almost acting and speaking like conquered peoples. This is um, Tony Blair when he announced a grant of a, th- of a million pounds to support uh, Islam, the study of Islam in British universities. He said, the voices of extremism are no more representative of Islam than the use in times gone by of torture to force conversion to Christianity represented the teachings of Christ. So he's, he's doing apologetics on behalf of Islam and also denigrating his own faith at the same time. Um, this was a sad incident that Patrick Sadeo reported where a Muslim family had converted to Christianity and they came under attack, their car was burnt and they met with the local Anglican bishop and his interfaith advisor was there as well. That wasn't a good sign. And the outcome of it was that the bishop sort of said, we wouldn't welcome you in the church. You must be bad people that you're being attacked. There's something wrong with you. And that's a very dimmy response. You're not meant to encourage people to convert from Islam. It threatens your security. So if, you, if you're a, a Muslim in Egypt and you become a Christian, you go and knock on the doors of the church and say, I'm a, I've become a Christian, can I join your church? They might not welcome you because their safety and security is dependent upon them not helping you. And to do so would be to break the condition, the, the age-old condition of their safety. But for an Anglican bishop in England to do it is quite extraordinary. President of France, Islam, he said, is one of the greatest and most beautiful civilizations the world has known. President Obama, we can we convey our deep appreciation for the Islamic faith, which has done so much over the centuries to shape the world, including in my own country. So Islam has made America great, I think. I think that's what he's saying. Um, this is Mary Robinson, who was the president of Ireland and then the president of the Human Rights Commission at the UN. She gave a speech in, in the UN in which she said it's important to recognise the greatness of Islam, its civilizations, its immense contribution to the richness of the human experience, not only through profound belief and theology, but also through the sciences, literature and the art. No one, arts, no one can deny that at its core, Islam is entirely consonant in agreement with the principles of fundamental human rights, including human dignity, tolerance, solidarity and equality. Numerous passages from the Quran and the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad will testify to this. Notice how she calls Muhammad a prophet. No one can deny from a historical perspective the revolutionary force that is Islam, which bestowed rights upon women and children long before similar recognition was afforded in other civilizations. And no one can deny the acceptance of the universality of human rights by the Islamic states. So it's an extraordinary statement um, by, by a Western leader. It was, it was written by her Muslim advisor, by the way. Um, and many examples that I could give. This is a, 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 a common word letter written by American evangelicals and written to Muslims of the world, and they, 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 they evoke feelings of... Gen- they, they praise Islam for its generosity, they feel humbled by it. They, they actually, they evoke, they, they express psychological attributes that are required of dhimmis living under Islamic law. Um, now, in 1850, the Ottomans, under pressure from the European powers, cancelled the dhimmi system, legally stopped it. And they te- theoretically gave equal rights to Christians and Jews and others living in the Ottoman Empire. One of the consequences of that was a series of massacres of Christians and Jews who local Muslims felt were no longer protected in Damascus in 1860, leading up to the genocide of the Armenians, which began in the late 19th century and then continued into the First World War when more than a million Armenians were killed. Um, So it was dangerous to give people their freedom if they're not protected by their slavery anymore. Um, And what happened, that's the backlash. 
Some groups managed to get free. The Greeks, the Serbians, the Hungarians, the Armenians, some of them at least, have all escaped from the system, the ones that weren't killed. But the Maronites, the Copts, the Assyrians, the Armenians still live under it. The Assyrians are just in the process of being annihilated in Iraq today, after earlier massacres in the 20th century. Um, other Middle Eastern Christians are leaving the Middle East in large numbers. Uh, Lebanon was once Christian majority, now it's Christian minority, and it's likely to keep going. Now, what happened basically in the, late, in the 19th and 20th centuries, Western powers forced Muslim nations to stop this system. But it's coming back. So Pakistan has moved from a secular state when it was first founded towards Sharia implementation and, and, the, and the human rights conditions of Pakistani Christians is getting worse all the time. They suffer rape, they suffer land being taken, they suffer discrimination, they can't get support from the courts. It's very grim. And uh, it, the, the, a lot of their conditions, if you track the actual disabilities they experience, the discriminations they experience, they replicate the conditions of the Dhimma uh, in many ways. Abuse of women is one of the outcomes of this. If, if lawful rape is a possibility if you're conquered in jihad, then you live under the threat of that all the time. And that creates sexual um, lack of safety for, for, the, for Dhimmi uh, communities. And we've had these problems actually of immigrant communities from the Middle East um, with very high rates of rape in Australia, in the UK, in, in Denmark and, and Holland. And so this issue of, of abuse of non-Muslim women is, is really deeply grounded in theology, but it's a, it's a major um, kind of issue, side effect of, of Islamic law. Um, I'm going to keep moving through this and just give some final comments. Um, Christians are uh, persecuted in many countries, but 80% of countries where they're badly persecuted are Islamic countries. The Open Doors watch list of 50, the 50 worst countries for persecution of Christians, um, about 40 of those countries are Islamic countries. And also, if you look at the list of Islamic countries, say that are members of the organisation of the Islamic co cooperation, 80% of those countries would be on that list. Um, so, being a Christian in an Islamic society is usually not very good, with some exceptions. And why is that the case? Why? I mean, there are communist countries like North Korea, which are just shocking for religious people to live in, whatever their religion. And Christians can be persecuted by other Christians, for example, in Ethiopia, um, Eritrea, you know. But and in, in the Soviet Union, in some of those Orthodox countries um, that, that are increasingly cracking down on Protestants. Uh, Buddhists can persecute Christians. Hindus can persecute Christians. Christians can persecute Christians. But the, the huge bulk of persecution and suffering of Christians in the world today uh, is, is incurring in Islamic context. And when you look at the patterns of, of what's happening, again and again, they track these Dhimma principles. For example, in Indonesia, which is not even an Islamic state, there are regular attacks on churches. And one of the problems is that the government is very unwilling to give permits to churches, with the result that many churches are technically illegitimate, they're not licensed. And often you get local Muslim communities very angry about this, these no churches should be built after conquest, we don't want a church in our community, and this creates conflict. Um, I know this is the case in Aceh. Christians, where I, where I did field work, Christians were forced to dismantle their church buildings uh, or else face a riot from the local community. So that's from one of the most tolerant Islamic countries in the world, where it's actually not against the law in, in, in Indonesia for a Muslim to become a Christian. Um, and many Muslims are, are turning to Christ. But nevertheless, there are, ev there are evidences of the impact of the Dhimma and its worldview in, in the situation there. In, in Malaysia, if, you, if you're a Muslim woman and you convert to Christianity, um, you're considered to be legally Muslim. And in Islamic law, you can't marry a Christian man. So if a, if a woman converts to Christianity and wants to marry a Christian, that would be adultery or it would be illegal, fornication in, 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 in Malaysia. And such converts are subjected to government, um, you know, uh, reprogramming attempts and all sorts of discriminations, it's very difficult. This is um, a, a relatively modern society. Malaysia is one of the more prosperous Islamic states, but it's bad, it's very difficult. And what's happening in Malaysia is that 
the system that was set up after decolonization has become more and more Islamized, and Christians are facing more and more pressure. And always the trend is towards the Dhimma principles. Restrictions on Christians follow and track these religious principles that act like a, a subterranean kind of set of laws that are not always visible but are driving the behavior of, of Islamic communities in their policies and treatment of Christians. This is also an, in, an issue for uh, countries like Australia in how do we manage the growth of Islamic minorities because they increasingly make demands that, that track some of these interests or concerns or desires. And how do we ensure that our multicultural society actually treats all people equally before the law? How do we communicate that to Muslim minorities in our societies? And how do we help them to think differently about what it means to be a citizen of a state and not to have an expectation that this dimmer worldview will be replicated in, in Australia or in Britain? Um, these are really, really serious challenges for us. I'm going to take, I'm going to stop there, and um, this is quite a heavy topic. Heavy topic, okay. And I'm going to, in the, in the last session today, I'm going to speak about a spiritual answer to this. Often when I give this talk, I talk about Jesus at this point. But I'm going to leave you in this unpleasant place, I'm sorry. <laughs> and <laughs> we're going to talk about the cross later. Um, uh, just one final comment about what I've described as the Dhimma system, the treatment of non-Muslims under Islam, which, as I said, was suppressed because of the interference of Western powers and is being revived across the Muslim world, is that it's been a taboo subject. It's a suppressed subject. It's not something that people talk about always. And you can get statements made about how beautiful it was for Christians and Muslims to live together in a golden age of Islamic tolerance. You'll see stuff in history books probably taught in your schools. It's not true. Uh, and there's a, you know, the reality is so confronting that there's a tendency to cover this, to gloss over this and not, not engage with it. The thing I'm most concerned about, however, for this, in terms of the gospel, is the spiritual impact of this worldview upon people. And one of the ministries I've been involved with is, is working with Christians who come from these backgrounds, these historical backgrounds, to help them find freedom in Christ. How do you get set free from a covenant of surrender that your ancestors have been living under for a thousand years? They've had their blow on the neck every year for a thousand years. How do you be free from that worldview of fear? So that's, that's what I'm going to speak about later on this afternoon. Because I think God is actually setting people free in powerful ways and bringing amazing changes in this system which has been around for such a long time.